just a sidestep there. And that's something that we could take later on, inshallah, if we get into like a fiqh of fashion type of class. What's good, what's not good in terms of the sunnah. So to move on from there, this is the important part right here, which is the authority of the sunnah. As I said, these words, they are life-altering words. Many of us would not doubt the nature of the Qur'an, that it is a source of legislation. It is an authority. Whatever's in the Qur'an, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. But the issue actually comes from many Muslims when it comes to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Oh, it's just sunnah, akhi. It's just sunnah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it's not in the Qur'an. Right? And you're going to be surprised in a few moments about some words that were mentioned about this very attitude. So what we're going to look at right now, very briefly, is the sunnah and its authority in the Qur'an. Words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sunnah and its authority in the sunnah itself. The sunnah and its authority amongst the, 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 righteous, the righteous predecessors, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the righteous people after them as well. And this is the most... Beautiful part, amongst the madahib, the schools of thought. And many of us are aware of that there are several schools of thought that have become very famous and widespread around the world, which are Hanafi. Are you Hanafi? You're Hanafi? Sha'ana Sha'ana Shafi'i. Wa'ana Amriki, Barakallah Fiq. It's a school of fiqh, yeah. Well, America, there's fiqh too. It's the funny fiqh. <laughs> yeah, I know. What do you have? There's Shafi'i too. There's, what do you have? Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali. And there's more than that, believe it or not. There's more schools of thought that have come up uh, throughout history. They have one called Zahiri. Have you heard of this before? Zahiri, that they take everything on its apparent meaning straight off the, straight off the, uh, off the words alone. So there are various different madahib that have become prevalent around the Muslim world. In fact, if you were to take a map, they've actually done this, and they've mapped out the regions that are predominantly one school of thought. So when you look at that, if you look at the northern, Af northern, northern Africa, if you have from, not Egypt, but over, and a little bit into southern Africa, or the southern tip of the northern Africa, they're what? They're Maliki, so you're Maliki, by, by birth. Yeah, just say it, man, just say Maliki, don't be shy. <laughs> okay <clears throat> when you start to move a little bit over into the Middle East area when you get into the uh, Saudi Arabia area what do you think they are Saudi Arabia is predominantly Hanbali they say They're, they have Hanbali uh, upbringing and then when you go into the Middle East up into Sham into Jordan and, 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 and uh, Palestine and Lebanon what are they Shafi'i when you go into Egypt so this is a unique country Egypt is? Egypt, a little bit of everything. They have a mix in there. How much Medina is Maliki? No, Medina is not. No, the, you're talking about Anas bin Malik who was there. Oh, excuse me, Malik bin Anas, he was there. The, the Imam Dar al Hijra was there in Al Medina. He never left Medina. Believe it or not, he was there, but the Hanbali Madhab, it overtook that area. And then when you start going to the rest of the Muslim world, all of the rest of them, the dominant Madhab is the, the Ahnaf. The Ahbab, the Hanafis, okay? So we're going to take a look at some of the statements of these great Imams. All of them were Imams in their own right. Abu Hanifa was from the most uh, well-known and from the first of them, who was considered to be a pioneer of sorts within the field of fiqh and the madhab. So when we look at these statements here, we can see from amongst the great scholars, uh, or excuse me, we'll begin with the authority, uh, the, uh, the authority of the sunnah in the Qur'an. And these are some of the statements that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said mentioning uh, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu The first of those you can find in Surah Al-Najm when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa here Allah is just referring to the Prophet alayhi wa sallam nor does he speak of his own desires it is only an inspiration that is inspired. Meaning the words of the Prophet ﷺ, he's not making them up. He's not just thinking about it, what matches with the Qur'an and just says it. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, that this does not come from him, 
But this is considered to be inspiration as well. Meaning it is revelation. Just as the Qur'an was revealed, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ were also revealed. You look at another statement in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا آتَاكُمَ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Here is an order. An order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the rule is that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command in the Qur'an, in the command for which is called fi'l amr, it is a command, an imperative, that means it is considered to be fard. It is considered to be fard or wajib, meaning it's a must. So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, and whatever the messenger gives you, then take it. And whatever he prohibits you from, then abstain from it. Meaning if the Prophet ﷺ comes to you and says, grow your hair to your shoulder, if he ordered you to do this, then you have to obey. Just if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you the same thing, then you have to obey. It's part of your faith in the revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is based on our iman in the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's from the pillars of our iman. So here are just two statements from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you find in the Quran. And here there are several, there are many, many others that would lead you to the same understanding. And from amongst those here, and you can see in the handouts back there or in front of you on the screen, there are several different ayat that I have highlighted. Surah An-Nahl, ayah number 44, Surah Al-Imran, ayah number 31, and so on and so forth. And these are references that if you need them, I'll be happy to provide them with, uh, to provide them for you, inshallah ta'ala. So there are many other ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the authenticity and the authority of the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Now let's change the channel. And we're going to move to the authority of the sunnah according to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it was actually a situation that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was sitting and talking with his companions and he said something extremely interesting to me. At the time, it seemed a bit odd. Because all of the companions are with the Prophet ﷺ at that moment. And they're living Islam as it's being revealed. They're following the Prophet ﷺ's footsteps, doing whatever he's doing. Following every little move that he makes. And he says to them, I fear that a hadith from me, my hadith, will reach some of you. While you are resting on your couches, you're sitting back and relaxing, and someone will tell you the hadith. They'll say, do you know that the Prophet ﷺ said such and such? And you'll respond by saying, leave me alone with this hadith. Don't worry about this. We don't find these words in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not in the Qur'an. So don't bother me with this hadith and this sunnah and this and that. It's not in the Qur'an, so just forget about it. Does that sound familiar? It does sound familiar. You tell somebody this hadith, they say, oh, you know, if it's in the Quran, then okay. But this is hadith, you know, this, don't, please. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he said this very thing, authentic narration, this authentic hadith, that he fears that this will actually happen and it has come to pass. Subhanallah. And they actually call these people, not people that are just lazy or negligent in terms of their religious practice. They say, oh no, more hadith and more things, more do's and don'ts. But people that actually reject the authority of the sunnah. They say, no, we don't follow hadith, we follow Qur'an. And they call them al-Qur'aniyun. Based on the word Qur'an, Qur'aniyun. They only use the Qur'an for their establishment of worship and belief. So what do you do? When you follow the Qur'an only and you've forgotten about the sunnah. We'll get into that. You'll see that in a moment exactly the problem that you fall into. Yes. This hadith was narr- uh, This You mean the, 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 the rawi? It's reported in the book by Al-Khatib, Al-Khatib and it was reported by Ibn Abdul Bar as well in their collection of hadith. Another hadith from the Prophet ﷺ in terms of the authority of the sunnah. Here which is related by uh, Imam Malik. And he says, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that I have left you, or I have left something with you, 
لَقَدْ تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ مَا إِنْ تَمَسَكْتُمْ بِهِ لَنْ تُظِلُّ أَبَدًا I've left something with you that as long as you hold on to it, as long as you hold on to it and live by it, you'll never go astray. Right? These are the keys to salvation. The keys to the akhirah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, these two things, Kitab Allah, the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, was sunnati, and my sunnah, my hadith. That if you follow these, these two sources of guidance and legislation, then you will find your salvation. And that's what we're looking for. So, to take one and to leave the other, it's not complete. Just from the looking, just from the face value of this hadith. To move on quickly to look at some of what the righteous scholars of the past have said regarding the authenticity of the sunnah. Here we can look at a statement by Hassan ibn Atiyah. He said that Jibreel alayhi salam used to descend to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with the sunnah just as he did with the Qur'an. That Jibreel who was the carrier and the messenger of Allah azza wa jal, the carrier of revelation, the inspired words, that he would come down with the Qur'an and he would also come down, he would descend with the words of the sunnah. That the Prophet sallallahu was also taught the hadith. He was also taught this understanding and this way. So this also reaffirms for us and confirms that this is an authority in Islam. Here you can see another one, Al-Awza'i, rahimahullah, he said, now this is a very powerful, powerful statement. He says that the Qur'an is in more need of the sunnah than the sunnah is in need of the Qur'an. What do you think about it? The Qur'an, listen carefully. The Qur'an is in more need of the sunnah than the sunnah is in need of the Qur'an. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Al-Imam Al-Awza'i, one of the, the mountains of knowledge of the past, one of the great righteous scholars, pious scholars of the past, he had this statement to say. Why do you think he would say something like that? He said that the sunnah is a qadiyah al kitab. It's a judge for the book of Allah. It's a qadi, it makes a ruling, this or that, yes or no, guilty, not guilty. The sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Why do you think that is? Bismillah. Why do you think that is? Why would he say such a strong statement? It seems strong. And especially culturally, depending on where you come from, this statement, you would almost think that this is kufr. How could you say such a thing? That the Qur'an is in more need of the sunnah than the sunnah is in need of the Qur'an. Yes? Might it be that since the Prophet was best left as the perfect example of the humanity for us, everything he did, he said, it's characteristic of everything you said. The Qur'an states various things, but this is how it was actually done in the Prophet. Therefore, it would have more truths in the sunnah. Because we've actually seen it, we see the true example versus words that we read in the Quran. Okay, this is what you're saying is very, very close, if not right on the money that you're saying that because the Prophet ﷺ was the best, most perfect example for humanity, and that his actions, I guess what you're trying to say is, were embodied, embodied the Quran and the teachings of the Quran. Right. Yes. Okay, so the Prophet Sallallahu his teachings, that they define some of the general statements that you find in the Qur'an. They specify them. And that, as was mentioned here, Imam, he says, that Aisha radiallahu anha, she was asked one day, the hadith was, she was asked, what, how were the manners of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? She said, كَانَ خُلُقَ نَبِيِ اللَّهِ الْقُرْآنِ that the manners of the Prophet ﷺ, they were that of the Qur'an. Meaning that within the sunnah is the Qur'an. It's there, it's present. The Prophet ﷺ was living it. Right? He was not a living Qur'an, but he was living the Qur'an throughout his actions. Right? 
his speech, his day-to-day -day habits. He was the example. And the, the best argument here for the Qur'aniyun, even though there are some ways that they try to get around this, is that when it's time to pray, how do you know what to do? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to pray. He even told us to pray on time. He even told us how to make wudu in the Qur'an. To wash the face and the hands and, and to wipe and all these types of things. But how do you know how to pray? Where do you put your hands? How do you sit down? What are the positions that, you've, that, you, that you fall into? How many units, raka'at, do you pray? One, two, three. What time in the morning, this time and that? How do you know? Is it in the Qur'an? Can anyone pick up the Qur'an now and tell me that it says, Salat al-Fajr is raka'atain? That when you say Allahu Akbar, you put your hands up, both of them with your palms facing outward to the level of your ears or your shoulders. Does it say that anywhere in the Qur'an? That you stand and then you make takbir and then you make rukur and then you make ruk and then you make takbir and you stand and then you make takbir and you make sujood and so on and so forth throughout the various different things of the prayer. Does it say that in the Qur'an? No. But we're doing it. And these Qur'aniyun, the people that reject the sunnah, they're doing it as well. They're doing the same thing. So you say, your, your whole premise is false because you're following something that's not in the Qur'an. There are many, many things in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been very general. A broad, sweeping ruling. And then the sunnah, it comes to define it. And that's why Imam al he said that the sunnah is a qadiya, it's a judge. Meaning that it's come to judge the situation, this or that. Because there were a number of situations that happened during the time of the companions. When you look at the books of hadith, when you look at Imam al-Bukhari's book, just the hadith, the metan itself, there's several volumes. The hadith. When you look at the other works, Imam Ahmad and his collection of hadith, Mus Musnad Imam Ahmad, it's voluminous collection of hadith. Books. The Qur'an is a book that you memorize. Part of its preservation is through the hearts of mankind, that they memorize this book. This was the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended that the book be carried. It be carried in the heart of men and women. And in order for it to do that, it has to be something that's doable, obtainable. One book, one volume with comprehensive language in there, comprehensive rulings that will be good for all times, all places, everything. Whereas the sunnah, voluminous works of hadith and so on and so forth, it would be very difficult. Now it's not impossible, there are people that have memorized these volumes of hadith, that carry with them al-Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Nasa'i and Numaja and so on and so forth. They carry all these hadith with them. But the majority of the Muslims are dedicated to memorizing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find it beyond their scope to memorize voluminous works of hadith. This was what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did. This is how He revealed His legislation through both the Qur'an and the hadith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, has the greatest wisdom, infinite wisdom. So this was the statement of Imam al-Uzai, which inshallah is clear. That when you're looking at the hadith, that we cannot move forward in making decisions based upon or for our religion simply based upon the Qur'an alone. But we require the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. There are many times that we require a hadith to explain an ayah, to explain the verse. Otherwise we could walk away and misunderstand it totally and act in contradiction to it, to say the least. So now we're going to move forward, insha'Allah ta'ala, to the, the madhabs of Ahl sunnah And these are the various schools of thought. To look at Imam al-Shafi'i. Thank you. They don't have Amriki madhab yet. The American way. Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he says, as you can see up here, that if the Prophet's statement opposes what I say, then take it and throw it against the wall. Imam Shafi'i. Great Imam. He says, whatever the Prophet ﷺ said, then you take it. And if what I said is in opposition to that, meaning the opposite or contradicts it or it's not matching, then you take what I said and you throw it away. Forget about it. This was the madhab of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. This was 
the foundation of his madhab, the fundamentals of Imam Shafi'i's his belief and his practice was based upon the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, the great scholar, the righteous, pious scholar, muttaqi, he wasn't making things up on his own. He wasn't just coming up with his own religion or his own madhab, but he was basing his rulings and his practice upon these two sources. Look at the next one here. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, Imam Dar al Hijra, the Imam of Medina, he said, All of us are either accepted or rejected, except for, and he was in Medina, by the way, and he used to teach in the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, right there in the Rawdah, and he would say, Except Sahib Had al Qabr, and he would point at the Prophet's grave. All of us, what we say and what we do, it is either accepted or it's rejected. The only one, the only exception is the Prophet ﷺ and he's buried in his grave. So whatever he said has already been written and it is dried, the ink is dry. It is there. So either we can say something in agreement and have it accepted, or we can say something that opposes it and it will be rejected immediately. This was the madhab of Imam Ahmad. Excuse me, Imam Malik. The madhab of Imam Malik was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Moving forward here. We have Abu Hanifa. Rahimahullah. Abu Hanifa, he says something similar. And there's actually several statements by this great Imam, Abu Hanifa. He says, If a hadith comes from the Prophet wasallam, then I take it. This is the basis, the asal of his madhab. The fundamental principles in his madhab were based upon hadith. If a hadith comes from the companions, then I take it. Here we go again, sunnah and hadith. Either the sunnah is the way of the Prophet, or the sunnah is the way of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, the rightly guided predecessors. And if a hadith comes from me, from those that followed the tabi'een and the tabi tabi'een, then they are men, and we are men. Meaning, they can say what they want to say, and we can say what we want to say, and it carries the same weight. There is nothing that compares to the statement of the Prophet wasallam and the statement of his companions, al-Khulafa al-Rashidun al-Mahdiyun. Nothing. Imam Abu Hanifa. Look at this great imam and what he has to say. He used to say, if there is a hadith, ala ra'si wal ayn. He used to say this statement. If you give me a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, ala ra'si wal ayn. Meaning, this is a, a term that only the Arab they use. <laughs> what does it mean? Out of respect. Out of respect, what? Says by my head and but with my head and my eye. Meaning what? That's the that's the direct translation. What would you say it means? When you when you accept something with respect, you go to the top part of your body. Okay, when you accept, this is very beautiful. This is mashallah. <laughs> you know, the Arab they have some very nice sayings. They have some very bad sayings too, by the way. But you have some very beautiful statements. Not to be uh, prejudiced or anything. That every language has its eloquence and its poetry and beautiful things. But here, Imam Abu Hanifa was using the Arabic language. He said, Al-Rasi wal ayn So when you accept something out of respect and honor for that, you what? You take it to the top of, who, of your being, of your existence. The top is your head. And your eye is your blessing, your ni'mah. Yes. In Urdu, they say, Sarfar al same thing. They have the same statement in, in, yeah, in American, we don't have that. We just take it with our hand. We take it with the left hand sometimes too, malish. <laughs> okay, so you can see the, the attitude of these great imams. And then finally we have Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, who was the last of these scholars uh, of the four madhabs. And he says here, it's strange to see people who know the chain of narration and the authenticity of the hadith, and then the, take the opinion of Sufyan, meaning Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah, another one of the great scholars. Right, so here you're dealing with the situation, Imam Ahmad, referring to another great scholar of that era, Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah, which was considered Jabal min Jibal al-Ilm. He was a, a mountain of knowledge. He was the leader of his era in terms of Islamic understanding and knowledge. So he's saying, Imam Ahmad, that when you know the hadith, 
and you know that it's authentic because there is an issue here. Is it authentic? Is it not authentic? Is it fabricated? Is it weak? Right? Yeah, there's room for argument there in some of the hadith. Not all of them. The majority of them that are reported with us today, Al-Bukhari and Muslim and, and Abu Dawood for the most part and Tirmidhi and so on and so forth. They have a lot of authentic hadith. Bukhari being almost, we'd say all of the hadith in them are considered to be sahih. And sahih Muslim as well. But when you get into some other subsidiary collections of hadith, you'll find that some are da'if, some, are the, some of them are mubu'a, they're actually fabricated and so on and so forth. But Imam Ahmed saying, not that, he's saying, you know the hadith, and you know that it's sahih. How could you take the opinion of someone else, Sufyan al-Thawri? How? To make this uh, parable, or this uh, example, clearer to you, right? If you know the hadith is sahih, how could you take the statement of Imam Malik, if it's in contradiction to that? Or Imam Abu Hanifa, if it contradicts what the Prophet ﷺ is saying? Or if it's not there, you have to remember this, that the madhab of these great scholars was based upon their ijtihad and their knowledge, their exposure to the hadith. It wasn't that all of them had every hadith that was collected from the Prophet ﷺ. It wasn't available like it is today. Today you can go on what my teachers in Medina used to refer to as Sheikh Google, and you can research the hadith and you get all of them, whatever you put in the, the word beard, lahya, and it comes up one it comes up 1,000 entries of beard. All of the hadith right there. You just move the mouse, you click it, and in a moment's notice you have 100 hadith about the beard, or about the salah, or about this or that. All of them are there. But these great scholars, they did not have this access to the hadith. Not to say that they were limited by any stretch of the imagination. But there are cases here or there that you find that the imams, they had to make their own ijtihad. Because there was a hadith that was not present at the time. So here is an opinion, like Sufyan al He would say, no, you should do this as sunnah, or this is mustahab, or this is makruh, or whatever. But then later you find there's a hadith that says, actually, no, it's not. So what would you take? John. You would take John. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe you're, you've been in Morocco for the last 20 minutes. You've been traveling mentally. You would take John. You would take Hadith. The Prophet ﷺ. Jazakallah khair. <laughs> Imam Marlton Masjid. Not Imam Dar al Hijra. Not even close. <laughs> So here you can see the, the authority we have now in the beginning of this series defined clearly what hadith, what is sunnah, what are the various categories of it, whether we're talking about fiqh or sul fiqh or ilm al-hadith, these categories all have their role and all have their importance. Then we looked at the authoritative nature, the authority of the sunnah and the hadith in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's an authority. It's a source of legislation. We looked at it in the hadith itself, the Prophet ﷺ, even warning us that there will come a time when people will say, forget about it. I don't want to hear hadith. And then we looked at it amongst the righteous scholars, and there are many, many, many volumes of works that have been written about this one subject, and then as well as the madhahib of uh, the world, the famous scholars uh, uh, of these madhahib. So as a uh, conclusion here, as a teaser...